Hello and welcome to Sexier Than a Squirrel, the podcast that teaches you how to beat the environment, how to be more attractive to your dog than anything that the environment can throw at you. Now, we've heard people this week who've been sexier than deers, who've yeah. been sexier than horse poo. Yeah. You know what? We've even had someone who's been sexier than a chuck it thrower. Yeah, it's been that, that big sexier than a squeaky toy there right? you go like insane so um <laughs> very exciting episode guys if you have if you're joining us for the first time and you haven't heard about this free downloadable resource that we've put together for you to get you up to speed you need to go and get that all you've got to do is go to absolutedogs.me forward slash start now you do really want that one because it's yeah. going to put you in the whole world that is absolute dogs and being sexier than a squirrel it's going to actually make it all very very tangible for you yeah and it, we've got in there some cool strategies some cool games that you're going to want to play so um in summary head on over there that's absolute dogs.me forward slash start now if this isn't your first time hearing this podcast we want to know have you left a review for the podcast because that's really important our aim in in creating this podcast is to make sure that no dog or owner is ever lost ever lost in a world where actually people are constantly constantly telling you there's no hope or you need to use um, punishment or intimidation or aversives on your dog. We know there's hope. You're listening to this. You know there's hope. You've seen the amazing real life results you can get. So leave a review for the podcast. That means that so many other people are going to get to share and understand and appreciate um, their dogs and their world so much more. I mean, it's an exciting place to be. So with that, what is the topic of today? Uh, well, it's one that we've been asked a lot since we started the podcast. It must be a million times over. Yeah. And since we start, started the podcast, it's one of be, been one of the most requested topics, and that is socialization. Now, socialization, when I think back, I don't know, maybe when I first started dog training, possibly now I'm thinking about 20-ish years ago, which is quite scary. Um, actually, socialization really was get your dog out everywhere yeah. with everyone, see everything. You had the list, right, yeah. Tom? You had the big, big and tick list. Let us know if you have experienced one of these lists or been given one of these lists. And effectively, it's like a checklist where you have to, I don't know, you have to, you, your puppy or your dog has to meet 50 different breeds of dog. All different ages, all different sizes, yeah. must meet everyone, at least yeah. 10 dogs per day. And then 50 different types of human, including, and why, you know, I've never met this guy, but I'm looking forward to meeting him. The, the, the guy with the big beard, wearing the high-vis jacket, with a backpack with the backpack with the wizard's hat on and the witch's broom right big old beard i've never met him but i constantly am in search of him because he must exist because he's on every one of these lists right and the thing is it makes it like this full-time job to socialize your dog but who's had that experience where actually you've done the socialization and actually your dog is more worried about the world because of it because and we've been there we remember i mean i remember very very clearly actually um with my border collie Fiji that I did so much I took her everywhere I saw everyone I did everything and I really was textbook with it like I was mm -hmm. absolutely making sure I met all the people I was yeah. absolutely taking her to all the places I was putting her in the situation yeah. time and time and time and time and time again and this is where it became a little bit, if we're honest, scary, right, Tom? Yeah, absolutely. And what, what we're going to be talking about today is actually how socialization in this traditional, um, in this traditional, traditional definition and framework of you must meet 50 different people of different types and put your dog in the situation, in the situation, in the situation, how actually this can do the opposite of what is intended. And then what we're going to talk about is what you can do instead. Now, before we do, we have a game changer win. Whoa. And the game changer win this week comes from Annie. And Annie is one of our amazing Training Academy students. She listens to the Sexier Than a Squirrel podcast. Hello, Annie. And she says, I was sexier than a deer charging out of the bus bushes and right past us this morning. Annie, that is impressive. That is super, super cool. And not bad for a six month old collie. I mean, that's I pretty that. impressive, like a six month old pup, really. And yeah. so, yeah, we love to celebrate your wins. So if you have a win, make sure we know about it. We want to know about all of your wins. Yeah. What were you sexier than this week? And the way that you can let us know your wins is by posting it on the, the Facebook page, letting us know on Instagram, whatever it might be, and let us know 
we'll give you a shout out and remember if you haven't already make sure you leave a review for the podcast and within that review you might say what you've been sexier than this week right um, so let's dive into into really what what it is that we want to share with you today and that is that at the basis of all animal training at the basis of all dog training there is one fundamental key element and that is that all animal behavior is guided by two things and that is that they want to avoid pain so they want to avoid feeling bad whether that's scared in pain worried frustrated whatever it might be they want to avoid that and also what they want to do is they want to seek out pleasure now in a very basic survival sense seeking out pleasure might look like finding food finding shelter finding a mate right um, but you the, see tom's priorities here the, the key is that um, these two these two drivers of behavior are happening all the time avoid pain seek out pleasure here is what is absolutely vital and this is why socialization in the traditional sense goes so 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 wrong the desire and the drive to avoid pain far outweighs the desire to seek out pleasure so what we mean by that is the desire to avoid fear the desire to avoid something scary far outweighs looking for any positive experience so in a practical sense that means that it makes total sense that sure your dog has met you know maybe a hundred dogs that they got on well with but then they met that one dog that scared them because it barked in their face or it jumped on or them even or even as simple as they saw a dog in the distance and they weren't sure what it, it was it was surprise. a big it was a big i don't know let's say a black labrador in the distance yeah. and it was it was enough yeah and that experience totally undid all of the great experiences that happened before it. So we want you to, instead to move away from thinking about socialization in the sense of a list and instead thinking of it a little bit like this, that one bad experience far outweighs 100 good ones. And you know that in even in, in day to day life that, I don't know, you have someone that says something bad to you. It lasts way longer than all the people that say good things, right? Yeah. Like it's 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 a normal um, like response. Yeah. And so um, treat it as something that happens in the dog world equally uh, the same. And so for me, this was like a revelation when we first started to talk it through and work it through and think about it. It was like, a, of course, like, of course, that is it, it makes complete sense. And it's something we see time and time again. And we've seen it in puppy classes. Yeah. We've seen it in adult dog classes. Maybe you go to a training class. Maybe you go to a, um, I don't know, a, a socialization style puppy group or um, and this is where we think we can make a huge difference. Right, Tom? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And this isn't just based on science. This is actually based on some some observations that we've had going through our dog training lives. And for sure, the first one that, that springs to mind for me is that I, I kind of did it the right way and then decided to do it the wrong way later on. So um, I, I remember growing up, I grew up on a sheep farm and um, we, there, were, there were dogs um, around and there were dogs that were involved in working on the farm and then there were pet dogs as well. And there was no formal socialization that went on. There was no like purposeful exposing these dogs to the world. And yet I remember growing up when I was really, really young, the, the, the working German shepherd on the farm that re rarely ever had a lead on, let alone trained on a lead, let alone kind of walked around a town center, could go to, um, could be put on a lead, go to the like nearest livestock market, behave absolutely impeccably and be totally cool with the world and then would go home and then would go back to a week where actually they were doing their their work around the farm and, and nothing else in between and then for some reason then we decided that actually you know the next dog that we got we should think about doing this socialization that everybody talks about so i and was still very when it's endorsed by like vets and yeah. people that um are of influence yeah. right and and so we were oh there's a new way of doing things and and also i was still really young at the time and so we did the whole socialization thing of meeting all the different dogs of going to the puppy party of going to um, the park going to the park you know meeting different people making sure that different people fed your dog treats right and um that dog didn't actually feel all that confident with the world in fact that dog became quite naughty but nice they became quite reactive to other dogs quite reactive to people and that was the experience that I, I i for sure had with fiji that i mean she's um eight 
eight, nine years old now. And uh, she did everything. We went everywhere. She saw everything. And at the same time, the thing that's interesting to note here is not everything was a good experience. Yeah. And yet that was the intention. Yeah. So the intention was, yes, you're going to have great experiences. But actually, sometimes when you, I don't know, visited a dog show and you kept taking her around the arena and around the rings and kept putting her into those experiences again and again and again and again, at some point, something would go wrong. Yeah. Just through the, sure, the, the, the sheer nature of the fact that you were doing it so many times. So there were so many repetitions that actually at some point something was going to go yeah. wrong. Yeah, absolutely. If you keep putting yourself in that situation, at some point something will go wrong. And right? I think the thing that made a difference, Tom, here for me was I, I kept eight, nine years ago, I kept putting them in the situation. Mm -hmm. yeah. I kept putting them in directly yeah. into the, the fire pit almost. I didn't see it as a fire pit at the mm -hmm. time, but I would keep doing that, thinking I was helping the situation. And that's it. And the human temptation, right, is when, when your dog has a bad experience with, say, another dog, you immediately think, oh my God, right, tomorrow I'm going out and I'm going to meet 10 dogs and they are going to have a great experience. And actually, <laughs> as an owner, it feels like a great answer because as an owner, you feel like you're doing something. Yeah. So your, your trainer or your behaviorist or your um, regular teacher or your class trainer or um, your vet say to you no go out now and meet 10 more dogs mm -hmm. because you've had one bad experience let's get you 10 good experiences so you go out and meet 10 more dogs and you feel like you're you feel like you've got something to do and you feel like you've got um, an answer to it. Yeah. So actually people want an answer and they want to make progress. So this feels like the right thing to do. Yeah. And yet what happens is we forget that one bad experience far outweighs 100 great ones. And in the process of trying to get up to the 10, 20 good experiences, you have another bad experience. Oh. And then it's like, no, I've got to start all over again. And therefore I go even stronger and expose them and to even more. You get a bit desperate, right? Yeah. Like you're looking for it. I'm like, oh my God, Labrador in the distance. Go, Wait, go, go. go. Go, go, go. Find them. Um, and the, the crazy thing is with that is that then people around you will also say, oh, you need to socialize that dog. They're antisocial, therefore you must socialize them. The fact is that you, you think about humans that, that you know don't feel all that comfortable socially. The worst thing you could do with them is plonk them in the middle of a party. Take them to a novel party, leave them in the middle, plonk them there and say, yoo-hoo, get on with it. Yeah. This is a good experience and they're like, no, no, it is not. I am petrified. So uh, what we're saying here is that actually exposure really isn't the way forward. Constant exposure, frequent exposure. It's not the way that we would be looking to and uh, the way that we'd be looking to go. And actually, when your dog does have a bad experience, the worst thing we can do is keep exposing them again and again, because actually they've not recovered from the last bad experience before you're exposing them to the next dog. What we're really looking to do is look for great opportunities for quality experiences yeah. over any quantity and actually not ever training in that moment yeah. if we can help it yeah. if it can be avoided actually we don't need to put them in that moment um often yeah and so it that, that's kind of the one side of the, the, the bad coin of socialization. But there's another side that's a little bit more positive, but maybe your dog did this pathway to where they are right now. And that is that you took your dog to the park, they met loads of dogs, it, we were socializing, 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 everything was great. Your dog began to absolutely love other dogs and really value them. And we equally see this at puppy parties. So for yeah. example, you start out with a puppy party and then you go to a socialization class and then you go to a junior adolescent class yeah. and then you go to maybe a young adolescent class. And suddenly you have a dog who doesn't just like other dogs and people, they absolutely they seek them. them out. Yeah. I mean, they hunt them out. They, you're walking and suddenly your dog is gone like a bullet and they're gone like a bullet in the other direction yeah. because they have seen another mm. dog. But the thing is that now the dog on the end of the lead is no longer a six kilogram puppy. They are in fact a 25, 30 kilogram dog. And so what we have to do is we have to stop letting them off lead. They can't, they can no longer meet every and dog. It's not safe for them to be off lead. And we understand that because when they run away to go and meet another dog, that dog A might not like them. The yeah. owner B might be scared. The way that the law sits is that actually your dog doesn't really need to hurt someone for them to sit poorly in the eyes of the law, right? Mm -hmm. People just yeah. have to be scared or feel fear from, from the dog. So actually, um, you are sensible potentially not to have that dog off yeah, lead. Absolutely. And then your dog sees other dogs on, while they're on lead. 
and they they experience now a different emotion and the emotion that they experience is where they think they could they have access to something they anticipate access to something they've always had access to something and they loved having access to something and now they don't and so the emotion that comes about is one of frustration now you know how you feel when you feel frustrated mm -hmm. right like everybody understands the feeling of frustration we've experienced it yeah we know how that feels and it doesn't feel great right and so what happens is when, when we're ex when we're feeling negative emotions where as a whether we're a dog or a human negative emotions start to spill into other negative emotions so now frustration and that negative association that's developing when when that dog sees another dog now switches into fear and now you've ended up in exactly the same place as the dog that maybe had bad experience and then had repeated exposure and then had really bad experiences you've you're in a place of a dog who experiences fear when they see another dog maybe they bark maybe they lunge maybe they get worried on the the end of the lead maybe they try and run away slightly different paths but the same outcome and it's all through this process of socialization so i guess this leads on to what should we want instead what would be the ideal what what is the aim in in, in developing and rearing a dog and training a and dog i get it i mean we can hear you you're there saying absolutely i understand all of that but actually if i don't do this what do i do instead yeah and so for us, what, what we are really, really passionate about is quality over quantity as, a, as a, a, a pillar of our rearing of dogs. And what we mean by that is that they have very, maybe much fewer experiences than other dogs might have that have been through traditional socialization processes. But actually those experiences are great ones. And if they do have a bad experience, what we don't then do is go stronger on exposing them. We give them a break. We give them a so time off. I'm going to give you an example here. And, and this is something Tom and I haven't talked about previously, but um, I definitely can feel it's a, it's a good moment for it. So Tom and I uh, were going out for a walk. It was a early, I think it was towards the end of last year and um, early morning walk and we were taking Thistle the dash hound mm -hmm. so minute to dash hound she hadn't been out with my dogs at all and we were going down to the bridle path and I said um, who are you bringing and he said yeah I'm gonna just quickly grab them let's go and he brought out Thistle the minute to dash hound now uh, while she hadn't met our dogs before um, and she uh, initially maybe um, looked around herself a little and we popped her down we walked mm -hmm. a little and um, the exposure was um, quality mm -hmm. uh, the exposure was minimum maybe half an hour 20 minutes of, of walk time yeah. um, out and about on a bridal path and a track um, all of the dogs were already preoccupied and busy they were all enjoying themselves they were having a great yeah. time there wasn't crazy excitement right you didn't put her down until um, I mean she's a minute to dash on so we're talking like three kilos of dog um, we didn't put her down mm -hmm. uh, on the ground until we'd kind of got to the point where we were going to let everybody um, gently off lead mm -hmm. so the exposure was calm minimal quality she wasn't the center of attention if that makes sense so yeah. no dog was going to just run up to her or pile in on her or say hi to her directly she was just part of the party yeah and it kind of it was very much a non-event yeah i suppose so there are a few takeaways that that we should really take from that and the first one is that it's quality not quantity the second one is is that and if we're developing great relationships between whether it's between two dogs or between a dog and a person we have to decide what should that relationship look like and for us that relationship should look like one of calmness one of you know we're we're, we're almost cohabiting we're not doing crazy play I, whole, the whole time i think that was the biggest thing tom that i took away from that was it was non-event mm. so we deliberately set it up as a non-event it wasn't like a big this is what we're going to do this is how it's going to work there wasn't like it was just low-key non-event yeah. training and the most important thing it was it wasn't that we just got them in the field and let them off together and stood there whilst they all ran around and played it's very much non-event even in the way that we walk and yeah. that we do it and i think we do it very naturally without really thinking it through or planning it but this might be something you need to go away and think through and plan like for us it was something that uh, we obviously wanted um little thistle to to get out with um some of the other dogs um that um she will she will 
people get to work with and meet. But at the same time, we didn't want it to be like a pressure um, experience. We didn't want it to be a, a tough experience. We, to be honest, we didn't even think hard on it. Yeah. It wasn't like a, a really like, this is a training session, yeah. right? And I think that often what we see, people um, think that there's some kind of time limit on socialization. And the reality is that, this, that sure, there is a socialization period whereby dogs seem more accepting of new things happening. But people get so het up on it, don't they, Tom? Yeah. I mean, they get so um, anxious that they've missed it or they've they've lost it or yeah. they haven't, um, or they stop doing anything because they've hit it. Yeah, and when you think then that you're working within a two week window, you're not going to make the best choices, right? You're going to go for quantity over quality, right? Um, and yet, when we think about this as th th this is a lifelong process whereby we're not socializing our dogs, we're, we're actually getting them used to novelty, we're getting them used to events happening and teaching them that, you know what, events happen and they're non events. When we take this approach, we can go much steadier on it because there's no time limit. And the fact is that, you know, for many breeds, let's take Border Collies, for example. Uh, let's think about your, your typical farm Border Collie. For many, 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 many generations, they have been bred to be born in the place that represents their the, the, the environment that they're going to live for in probably for the rest their of their, whole, life, their yeah. whole life. So uh, they're born on a farm. They will then either stay on that farm or they will move to a different farm and be a working border collie. Now that means that the socialization period isn't hasn't been all that important in their history, right? Because we don't need a big, long, late socialization period because where they're born is where they stay to some extent. So actually, often what we think is a socialization period of eight to 10 weeks or eight to 12 weeks it might well be that the socialization period happened while your dog was at the breeder. So let's say five to eight weeks or yeah. five to seven weeks. So actually, typically in Border Collies, this is something that we for sure acknowledge, yeah. right? And so really what we don't want you to feel when you get a new dog is that when you get a puppy, that there's some time limit two week window where you've got to go crazy on, on exposing them to things. That is really damaging to dogs. And even more than that, if you have an older dog and people are telling you you need to socialize them, being aware that, again, it's not a, a hasty process. It's about getting your dog used to events happening in the environment, not putting them in events. So if we reframe this and we look at this as um, growing confidence in our dogs, then actually there's a whole um, new opportunity for you. You take away a hell of a lot of pressure yeah. for yourself. And actually we end up with confident rock stars, um, which we see as um, our game changer community, right? Like yeah. that for us is exactly what we're trying to grow. And it's no, there is no cutoff. There is no, you can't do any more here. You can't improve this actually when you're growing confidence and when you're growing um it's just a different way of thinking it's really yeah. a different way of thinking and the three minute games that we play for sure can be tailored towards this if needed yeah absolutely and then when and, and the cool thing is is when we start to frame our understanding of how our dogs see the world as this this sort of flip-flop between avoiding pain and seeking out pleasure it really changes what we do in the it's less about what we do and it's more about what we don't do it's less about what we put our dogs in and it's more about what we avoid exposing our dogs to so part of this is that we've got to be our dog's guardians we've got to be our dog's protectors and within that we've got to know when to say no when we see i don't know the children running up to our dogs and and we're we're thinking oh my God, my dog's not going to enjoy that when experience. someone says, actually, I just love to give your dog a hug. I just want to come and give your dog a hug. We've got to look after our dog's interest mm -hmm. and not only think um, about the person who actually sometimes it can be awkward to say no, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and in this respect, then socialization in that traditional sense becomes less about a process that we do and more about effectively guarding and protecting our dogs through this pro through this process that's a lifelong process and it's happening all the time and it's only us that are going to guard our dogs from it and now don't take us um in, in the wrong way here we're not saying that there are no experiences that can be great for your dogs and we don't want you to overthink it and get over complicated here um, i suppose what we're saying is that you can start to think about these things 
things and sometimes saying no is the right thing and, and don't feel bad about saying no most of the time the reason we don't say no to something like I don't know um, can I do something with your dog or can I stroke your dog or can I pet your dog or can I hug your dog or can I give your dog a big kiss whatever it is often the reason we don't say no is we feel socially awkward in saying no so actually rehearsing responses and I actively have a couple now where I will say no he's not friendly or no she's not friendly or no she won't enjoy that experience or um, you know what come up with your own like tell us your own we'd love yeah. to hear more of them because I think it really does help people uh, to be able to rehearse that and say that because sometimes it's just a social pressure yeah. uh, when we when we reframe this whole um, this whole concept of you know getting our dogs used to the world is actually we're teaching them that events happen and events are non-events you know things ha something happens over there and it's cool to stay calm over here and ignore it then that changes what we do so effectively what we're saying is it could be as simple as you go about your day-to-day -day life with your dog you keep some of their daily food allowance to one side and every time a new event happens every time something happens in the environment you just actually deliver some of their daily food allowance to them so again people get overworked up about how they might use their food or what they might do with their food for me something like using my dog's daily food allowance for actually not um, running over to say hello to the dog mm. in the distance or for just sitting with me loosely on a on a leash or for um, choosing me over the squirrel. You know what, well, all of those things are worth reinforcing. So all I do is I keep back a bit of um, the gold pot, I suppose. And with that pot of gold, I use it towards things that effectively are disengaging from the environment. Yeah. So what I end up having is a dog who can disengage from the environment and can just re-engage with me or just engage with me and stay engaged with me in the first place. And that for me is very, very empowering because it means effectively we have an invisible leash and we don't actually need a leash at all because the dog um, that I I'm working with is normally pretty um, clued up with actually reinforcement happens in this great place and I don't need to engage with those dogs in the distance or I don't need to engage with the picnic on the floor or there's no there's no real value in it for yeah. them and you know think about how we go through life we go through life and we're aware of things in our environment but we don't engage with all of those things and so we need dogs to do the same. Like, we let's say, let's say I was uh, at a fair not that long ago. It was like a, um, a seasonal fair, and they had I don't know candy floss, mm -hmm. and they had donuts, and they had all of these sugary goodies that would potentially be things you'd want to engage with. Now you don't engage with all of them, mm -hmm. right? There are a couple you might engage with, <laughs> but you're not going to take all of them, right, Tom? Like yeah. there are there are, you you definitely have the ability to disengage. Yeah, and and that is what this this process needs to look like it needs to look like calm disengagement from events that are happening in the environment and the way to train that is literally by using your dog's daily food allowance and giving them some when they see or hear or even if not you know often we think we, we get a bit obsessed with oh did he see that should i reward it how about something happened and they're probably aware of it and whether they look at it or not who cares deliver some daily food allowance when in doubt just deliver some daily and food allowance it's their daily food allowance and they're going to have it anyway mm. so why not catch them doing i remember a great great mentor and coach of mine when i was learning uh, to be a teacher at the time and um, they said catch them doing something right and this was talking at the time about teenagers i mean mm. it's a tough it's a tough thing to do catch them doing something right but it's not dissimilar to working with a naughty but nice dog you guys know that we love our naughty but nice dogs we're very very passionate about our, our naughty but nice dogs and so for for me catching them doing something right is is really crucial and if you've got the daily food allowance and you're using it in that way when you ditch the bowl you ditch the routine and um, you guys are game changers you know what those are about I think that that makes a huge difference so with that what we're saying is take the pressure off have fun with it think about quality over quantity this is not a a full-time job this is something that you and your dog are going through life together and you're working on you both understanding that events happen around you that to, to respond calmly to and we disengage from them and with that you actually don't need this whole socialization in the traditional context and your dog is better for it so that is all for today on sexier than a squirrel remember if you have not already downloaded your free resource go to absolutedogs.me forward slash start remember to leave a review as well so that it gives everybody else context um, when they want to listen and We'll see you next time. Remember, stay, stay sexy. sexy. Hey, before you go, have you taken part in the worldwide Sexier Than a Squirrel Challenge? It's a 25-day online video program. Huge energy, amazing community, and over 6,000 people are already taking part. 
The only question is, you know where you are today. Where do you want to be 25 days from now? Head to absolutedogs.me forward slash sexy.